Lot of information you cannot get like why a specific compound is colored, right? what happened to their magnetic properties because these are the things we are really really interested in. So, this is where crystal field theory comes in. Of course, it is based on the failure of the valence bond theory or as that is how in the book you read that where valence bond theory kind of fails cannot explain further and crystal field theory basically picks up. So, of course, we can just learn crystal field theory, but the problem is valence bond theory is so simple. I think nobody kind of see you cannot forget the history of something and just take the present. I mean present is something different not crystal field, it is something different right uh, which we may not be or we will not be talking too much. So, it is you know present means temporarily present. Okay. 100 years down the line it would be explained in a completely different way or be more better way. Of course, crystal field theory has tremendous limitation as well, but we may not be talking about those. So, as we progress or as the chemistry understanding progressed we will try to do. So, what we are saying that valence bond theory really cannot explain tetrahedral and square planar okay, when it is any distortion what valence bond theory is discussing is an ideal situation kind of. Any anything bond elongation, shortening, these things cannot be explained by valence bond. In a moment, you will see how the distortion is going on by crystal field theory. Color of complexes, of course, you cannot have any idea about the color, what color the complex should be. I say a compound is this hybridization or this many ligands are there, this there, that there, crystal field theory can explain. However, we did not explain yet, but valence bond theory cannot explain those temperature dependence, why magnetic properties are dependent on temperature. If you increase the temperature what happens whether magnetic susceptibility or the magnetic behavior goes up or goes down or how it goes down or how goes up those sort of things we will be th discussing. Okay. Now, crystal field theory first we, we have to look at the orbital. This is something you have to kind of have it within your mind very clear what we are talking about the atomic orbital, these orbitals mainly the 5 d orbitals right. We have 5 d orbitals how they are and along the axis how they are where they are. Now, this is the z axis or g axis whatever you want to call ok. Now, the d g 2 orbital is going to be like this the electron density is going to be over here and over there along the z axis. So, axis you can think along this one let us say this is x axis, this is y axis, this is z axis ok. In three dimensional scenario you can take this corner any corner one axis another axis my laser pointer failing any corner you can pick up x y z of course, 90 degree angle it may not be always true here. Now, this is d z 2 orbital. So, along the z axis this is d x 2 y 2 along the x and y axis and this is let us say d y z that means in between y and z. So, if you look at here if this is z axis this is the electron density over here and the lobes are here and below this one there is lobe ok. If it is x and y axis then d x 2 y 2 will be along this x and y axis along just right on top of those axis, uh, right on top of the z axis is d z 2, right on top of x and y both plus and minus direction is going to be your d x 2 y 2. In d x y will be in between d x y where is d x y d x y see this is let us say x axis or whatever y axis x and y as you see these are right on top of the axis in between x and y axis is d x y. Similarly, in between y and z is going to be d y z. So, this is z axis center the lobes are here this is d z. Now, if you look and say that this is let us say x and this is y d x 2 y 2 is going to be here right. 
chop and dxy is going to be so this is y axis this is x axis right on top of y axis sorry we'll come to that so it is going to be like that okay now you have to i'm sure you have seen it before you have to be really really clear about the their positioning i think we'll come to that let me tell uh, show you where they are over here uh, no we'll, we'll, we'll come back in a moment let me tell you so what crystal field theory assumptions are it's very simply these are electrostatic interaction it's a metal center is a cation ligand is an anion most often so it's a cation anion interaction or electrostatic interaction ion ion interaction or ion dipole interaction previously we are thinking just about the covalent interaction right now if you are thinking so metal about metal metal has electrons if you are bringing ligand ligand has electrons so these ligand and electrons and metal electrons are going to repel each other they are going to they are, they are electrons same charge right although metal is positive ligand is negative let's say or neutral or whatever it is but if you bring them together those electrons of the ligand and electrons of the metal they are going to repel each other so thereby the energy of the total system going to be increased if d level energies are for example over here if you bring the ligand from the equal distance or from the all distance or all direction equally then then also the energy of the d orbitals will go up it's a spherical let's say cricket ball you are going to put the pressure on cricket ball from all directions cricket ball is going to be destabilized well in this case ligand approaching ligand is going to make cricket ball destabilized okay now this is under ide ideal situation where all the ligands let's say are coming from every distances or every directions all the distance all the di directions now in reality what you have seen is ligands are not there from every directions it is specific ligand is here 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 and here only few directions this is the direction for z axis let's say this is the z axis this is the let's say whatever y axis this is x axis right so ligands are going to approach the metal center only from a specific direction not from here it's just along this direction not from here not from here not from there it's a specific di direction now these are the directions where the metal orbitals are there there you have dz2 there you have dxy this is the one where you have dxy so eventually what you will see is i'll uh, show you since ligands are coming from this direction directly those orbital dz2 and dx2 y2 orbitals are going to be rippled very much means they are, they are going to be unstable they are going to be high in energy so over here 5d orbitals are there since ligands are coming specifically from z or towards z axis y and x axis any orbital that is facing those axis directly they are going to find the consequences that means they are going to have the energy increased their energy will be increased any other orbital for example dxy which is over here in the middle in the middle they are going to be perturbed but not too much in reality with respect to this one they are going to be stabilized because this is the total stabilization with respect to that something is going to be destabilized something is going to be stabilized okay now let's look back all the orbital if you look back one more time very carefully this is the gz2 anyone has anything to say please uh, speak out 
now dz2 orbital dx2 y2 orbital and you can see all these orbital okay right now also if it is not clear you look back at the note i'm sure it will be very very clear the pictures are very clean now <coughs> as we are saying that plus and minus attraction electrostatic attraction will be there now two of these orbital which is dx2 y2 and dz2 or dz2 these are the orbital let's say all these orbitals are there these are the ones which will be facing the ligand directly like this so ligands will be coming directly from two different angle or from two different direction for dz2 so dz square orbital will be high in energy right it's it was previously it was all of them are same and having same energy or so called degeneracy five d orbital were degenerate that's so far you have mostly learned of course you may have learned this one as well but since you see that there is a discrimination there is a preferential attack you are going to get it destabilized because they are going to interact directly now if you look at the dx2 y2 this is the dx2 y2 orbital and four of the ligands are coming from this direction exactly of course this is going to be also destabilized so what you have learned so far is dz dz2 and dx2 y2 are going to be destabilized but if you are looking at let's say this is dxz orbital okay x axis and z axis dxz orbital and the ligands are approaching right actually from the middle not directly towards these lobes so their energy will not be overall destabilized because we have already destabilized by bringing the ligand comparatively they are going to be stabilized that's how the ligands are coming right sorry that's how they are coming coming in so they are not fitting the bill right right on top of each other they are just you know squeezing in not head on collision now so dxz will be stabilized dxy dyz is the same scenario it's just different axis so overall we see that it is split into like this two of them getting destabilized three of them getting stabilized stabilized means stabilized with respect to where it started not in the free ion over here this is a free metal ion with respect to free metal ion when you have a metal complex formation it is all the d orbitals are going to be net destabilization will be there their energy is going to be high with respect to this some of them will be destabilized some of them will be stabilized but the net destabilization is going to be this much if you have a free metal ion it is stable the moment you put ligand in it it is going to be unstable or destabilized with respect to that destabilization okay so that's how it is going to be but with respect to free metal ion of course they are destabilized okay now this is what is octahedral field is all about you see octahedral complex six ligands are there surrounding the metal center five d orbitals getting destabilized and further splitted this is no longer degenerate of the same energy right now this is also another way to look at it two ligands and these black balls are ligands and how they are coming and all the d orbitals are superimposed over here you can see which are facing what okay now this is for octahedral field this is called eg orbital eg orbital and this is t2g orbital three of them so eg is dx2 y2 dz2 and t2g is dyz dxz dxy okay so three of them and two of them now the extent to which with respect this is called barry center where the zero is okay with respect to that the destabilization will be the same amount compared to the stabilization why it seems like unsymmetrical because there are three orbitals so six electrons can be filled six electron versus four electrons so four time destabilization and six time stabilization so it's a there is a factor this this distance from the barycenter this distance is 0.6 this is 0.4 
from the middle this is 0 0.6 and 0 0.4. So, from here this is going to be 0 0.6, this is going to be 0 0.4. Okay, I should have stabilized, I should have switched off this one. 0 0.6, 0 0.4, okay. We will come to that again. Now, some more informations are given which you can read very clearly, I will not dwell too much on that. Stabilized one, destabilized one. This is also another way of looking at this, the same thing, exactly same thing. You may not be able to see it clearly from here, but in slide it will be clear. dz2, dx2, y2 and the three, two orbitals and three different orbitals in the compound form or in how they interact. Okay. Further, it is much better, I think this is the last uh, slide hopefully on that. You see Z, dz square and dx2, y2, dzx, dyz, dxy, same thing for how the ligand is coming. See, when you take the printout of these things, if you take the same printout, I do not mind, but uh, the information is not different, but once you are seeing in the computer, for example, you will be able to see it clearly what exactly we try to say. That will give you a crystal clear picture hopefully what is going on in here. So, once again I will take the break in a moment. This is the 3 5 of the total distance is called delta 0 or 10 dq. This is going to be your 6 dq, this is 4 dq or so to speak 3 5 delta 0, 2 5 delta 0. This is something you need to remember. The total is called 10 dq, 4 dq and 6 dq. 0.4 and 0.6, 4 dq, 6 dq. Okay. If it is delta 0 you are saying, this is going to be 0.4 delta 0, this is going to be 0 0.6 delta 0. And these are the E g, T 2 g we will be calling, the difference between them is delta 0, 10 dq, so on so forth. Anyway, so let us let us continue over here. What we see, this is the total 10 dq we are saying, what is dq? It will be clear soon enough or this is the delta 0, the distance between this T 2 g and E g or the energy difference between these two. Some of them are destabilized, some of them are stabilized. Let us say, let us take some little bit more practical example. You have a titanium hexa aqua complex with 3 plus, scandinium titanium, scandium titanium. Okay. Um, it is D 2 S 2 it is going to be d1 then after 3 plus so 3d1 so that means no longer we will be saying it 3d1 we are going to say it t2g1 is 0 because if you see the filling up of the electron now it's going to happen the one which is stabilized first and then either over here or back to here so, the filling of electrons we are trying to see no longer we will be calling it D 1. It has to be defined at as T 2 G what? E G what? Let us say T 2 G 5 E G 0, T 2 G 3 E G 2, T 2 G 4 E G 2 or T 2 G 6. So, how we are going to do that? This is what we are going to discuss. So, in other words, whether all the let us say you have 6 electrons. 6 electrons if you are having each of them are one orbital. Therefore, technically you can have 6 of them over here or 3 of them over here, 2 of them over here and another over here. 4 plus 2 you can say G 6 plus 0 or whatever other power mutation combination you want to have. What order these d orbitals will be filled that is what we are going to discuss. The answer to that question is very simply, it will depend on the ligand. That is why it is also called ligand field stabilization energy. Ligand, if it is a strong ligand, what is a strong ligand? Let us say, I will come back to that again. If it is a, let us say cyanide, cyanide is a strong ligand. Okay. Aqua, water, water let us say for example, usually a weaker ligand or you know, it is all relative again, there is a spectrochemical series we will bring. Okay. 
that will tell what is strong ligand, what is weak ligand. Fluoride may be a weak ligand, okay. So, chloride may be weak ligand, CO may be a strong ligand, okay, so on. So, depending on the difference this energy is, is having, like how much difference is there between T2G and EG, it is this much or that much? If it is this much difference, then electrons will be occupied all T2G and EG because you know that Hund's maximum principle that spin, spin has to be maximum and so on. But if it is this one, that Hund's rule may not be the applicable here because you know it is very big. So, putting electron in this orbital, T, EG orbital is going to cost you too much, too much of energy. Of course, another problem is the pairing. For if you want to pair up, pair up pairing energy is also there. If you want to pair up over here, some energy you have to give whether pairing energy is high or the distance or the energy difference between these T2G is, in, is high. That you need to kind of know. You, know. you don't need to memorize, we are going to tell you what is the scenario. Okay? So, we need to know what is the ligand, what usually is the pairing energy, what, what is the oxidation state of the metal. That also varies higher the oxidation state, you will see the splitting will be high, this T2G EG gap will be high, 3D to 5D gap will be increasing, 2 plus to 5 plus gap will be increasing. Therefore, if the gap is increasing, pairing become easy, because you know it, is, it cannot go too much if it is gap is too much. If gap is low, then pairing will not occur, it will be both in T2G and EG, if this is EG, this is T2G, okay. That is what we are going to see now, I am kind of summarized. Over here, it is going to be T2G1 EG0, now everything you have to explain or you have to write in this format, why we see purple color in this titanium hexa aqua complex, why do we see purple color, it is like this. The UVB's maximum, the absorption is going to be this 2300 or 20300 wave number. So, that is actually the gap between the T2G and EG we will show. So, let us say this is, this is your T2G electron and you put the energy, the light, it is going to convert from T2G level to EG level and that is where you see the in terms it comes out the absorption energy, where it absorbs. That means, how much energy you have given to bring let us say T2G electron, one electron from here to here, that is what nothing but you see as absorption. The peak you see or you have a metal complex, you shine light you want to see the electronic transition from one level to other. It could be let us say sometime T2G, T2, T2G or it could be usually the for one to see you have to have T2G to EG conversion. From T2G orbital any of them because they are degenerate to over here, that is the energy you need and that is, is going to be your absorption energy and depending on that how much energy you absorb as we say why the color different color comes, how much energy is required based on that or what wave number is required based on that you will be able to see the color. So, you give them white light, simple light, we end up seeing some color based on what is being absorbed and what is being emitted or indirectly what is being emitted. So, for T2 this titanium hexa aqua complex we see that this is the UVB's absorption, this is nothing but this transition from T2G to EG level and that is how the speak is coming, okay. That is the absorption that is happening from for transferring T2G electron to EG electron. Of course, there could be multiple transition, there could be multiple if it is a simple electron system one electron system, if you have two electron systems, three electron, four electron, five electron and so on and based on the electronic configuration, you can have multiple transition. Therefore, your peak could be like three, four peaks or I mean your spectrum could be having three, four peaks 
or different region, different things can happen. So, simply speaking some sort of transition has to occur. In d orbital itself five of them are degenerate. You are not going to explain that is why you cannot explain color by crystal uh, by valence bond theory. But crystal field theory gives you an idea of where the origin of the color is. This is nothing but transition of one sub level to another one. Right? So, this is where crystal field theory becomes superior compared to your valence bond theory. Valence bond theory what you have done d 2 sp 3 or sp 3 d 2 whatever sp 3 and so on. There you cannot explain where the color is coming from. Okay, enough. Now, of course, as I said there are scenario where you can have more than one electrons. right? So, d 1 to d 3. So, of course, Hund's rule will be promoted. Now, for 4 electrons you can have t 2 g 4 e g 0, t 2 g can have total up to 6 electron or you can have t 2 g 3 e g 1, 3 of them are going to be filled out. After filling out the fourth one will be the e g 1, e g right. Now, I will come to come with that with more pictorial diagram, I think I will skip that. Now, this is what it is. So, t 2 g orbital 1 electron, T 2 g orbital 2 electrons, T 2 g orbital 3 electron. There is no story of E g because E g is high in energy, why it will go to high in energy. After D 3 then you have dilemma, then you have problem whether you send it to E g or you pair it up with T 2 g. So, there are two scenarios, high spin complex will have T 2 g 3, E g 1, D 4 option 1, option 2 will be T 2 g 4 E g 0. This is T 2 g, this is E g, E g over here nothing in there. So, you have low spin complex, this is high spin complex because 4 unpaired spins are there. Here you have 2 unpaired spin. So, up to D 1, D 2, D 3 you do not have to worry at all. You just put T 2 g 1, T 2 g 2, T 2 g 3. After that whether it is T 2 g 4 E g 0, T 2 g 4 E g 0 or T 2 g 3 E g 1 which one is going to be predominant or which was going to be happening. That will be determined by ligand metal which metal it is what d orbital they are having what is their oxidation state. All these factor will put together will determine whether it is going to be a high spin complex or low spin complex. It is not complicated at all just go through simply I will try to explain when what you can expect. You do not have to remember again, you do not have to remember what will be the delta 0 and what then what will happen that that sort of memorization is not required. Okay. So, in other word if delta 0 or that 10 d cube value we were talking difference between T 2 g and E g if this is small then you will see T 2 g 3 E g if that difference is small the spin will try to be maximum or you know electronic spin will be maximum. So, T 2 g 3 E g 1 will be happening if delta 0 is small. For this to happen T 2 g 4 to happen you have to pair this two electrons right. That means, you are dealing with pairing energy. If pairing energy is favored, if pairing energy is less compared to this delta 0 then you are going to have this low spin configuration. Okay. Now, of course, lot of things I have given written the same thing again and again written, but essentially once it is clear to you, you do not have to read this slide too much. Okay. I think we have explained already. Now, I will just give you a phenomenon. So, what we again what we have said up to D 3 you do not have to worry, it is going to be T 2 G 1, T 2 G 2, T 2 G 3 after D 4 you have to decide that again let us say at D 8 you do not have to worry it is going to be T 2 G 6 E G 2 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 whatever way you want to fill out D 8 D 9 D 10 you do not have to worry. It is going to be only one configuration possible because your goal is to minimize the energy without compromising the spin. Of course, Hund's rule says the spin should be maximum, right. You try to do that, but 
while you are trying to do that, you have to also mind the gap distance between T to G E G, whether it is going to be unpaired spin or paired spin. After filling T to G, you have to up from 4, 5, 6, really the one cases where and 7 as well, 4, 5, 6, 7, you have to worry about whether it is going to be high spin or low spin. Up to 3, it is going to be always high spin, there is no low spin scenario almost, right. And after 8, 8, 9, 10, it is always one configuration. 4, 5, 6, 7, it is going to be high spin or low spin, that is what you are going to use. High spin means spin is maximum, low spin is spin is minimized with the given situation, ok. Now, <coughs> something like these complexes, if you see some easy complex like very soothing for the eyes, those are going to be high spin, like iron aqua, very easy complex looks like water molecule, iron is there. 3, 2 plus, 2 plus mind you, EG complex, the difficult complex could be 3 plus means which is more higher charge. Now this is going to be high spin over here, because the delta 0 you see is this much pairing energy is high, pairing energy high means you are not going to get it paired, you are going to have the unpaired spin, right. Now iron hexacyanide. We are all talking about octahedral complex, do not forget that, 6 ligands are there, we, we did not talk about tetrahedral as of yet. So, 6 of them, this is going to be a strong ligand, Cyano, cyanide is a strong ligand, that means the gap between T 2 G and E G is very, very high, ok. This will be D 6, right, so those 6 will, electrons will be T 2 G 6 not T 2 G 4 E G 2, I think some of them are, some of you are having little bit dizziness, let us see, try to explain in the board. What we are having, let us say D 6, this is T 2 G 3, 3 of T 2 G and 2 of E G, you can have this as one scenario, right, other scenario is nothing here all paired up, right. So, this is T 2 G 4 E G 2, this is a high spin situation, that is what is happening in iron hexaqua complex 2 plus. Now, iron cyanide 6, FeCN 6, hexacyanide, ok, 4 minus, now you have D 6 total electron, right. Now, of course, how it is, it is iron 2 plus, this is also iron 2 plus, both of them are iron 2 plus, iron 2 plus that is why it is 2 plus, iron 2 plus 6 minus that is why it is 4 minus outside, right. Or both of them are D 6 electronic configuration, only thing that is differing is the ligand, metal is in the same oxidation state, hexa coordinated, ligands are different. What you are seeing here is the distribution of electrons are different. The first one will have this electronic distribution, second one is going to have this electronic distribution, because let us say so to speak, the difference between these two guy is high, distance, this difference is very large. If you look at this delta 0 or 10 dq is this much, pairing energy is less. So, thereby it will pair up very easily, it will electron cannot go and jump over there. In this case, the pairing energy is high, but delta 0 is small, so it is going to be, it is going to follow your Huns rule, ok or I mean of course, it is always following Huns rule, sometime there is no option, ok. When there is no option, you are going to end up getting that configuration. This is usually speaking, most of the cases I think high spin will be preferred, of course, most of the cases is a wrong statement, but it is a ligand dependent, metal dependent, but lot of things that we see in uh, you know in the regular books, usual books, those are going to be high spin species. Unless it is high oxidation state of the metal, 
and strong ligand, it's not going to be low spin. If it is high oxidation state, let's say iron 4 plus or you know some high oxidation state and ligand is strong ligand, then you are going to see low spin because the T2G and EG splitting is going to be high. Okay. Now next one, cobalt F6. Cobalt is uh, here 3 plus, 6 of the fluoride, 3 minus total, D7 configuration. Cobalt is D7 S2, iron cobalt, yeah. And then if it is uh, iron cobalt nickel, D7 S2, it is 3 plus, right? I think something is wrong there. Is it not? It should be D6, right? Okay, let's assume that this is D7, but this charge are wrong. Okay, cobalt cobalt is D7 S2, so nine electrons. If three are taken, so two are taken, then it is. Let's say this is going to be your four minus. Okay, the charge is wrong here. I don't know how come. So anyway, it is a D7 system, both of them are D7 system, ignore the charge, just take my word, ignore the charge, D7 system, D7 system, one is high spin, another is low spin. It is also to tell you, sometime you see the ammonia complex is going to be low spin, sometime it is high spin. Again that depends on the metal center, I will give you a summary, okay. let me give you the summary. The delta 0 will be increasing in this order, 3D, 4D, 5D, 5D will be highest. Higher oxidation state will give you the higher delta 0. Now over here you see with the chromium, chloride, aqua, ammonia and cyanide, the energy between T2G and EG, how they are differing. So you can say that this is a weaker ligand, this is little bit stronger, this is more stronger, this is the strongest in this series. So the difference between T2G and EG can tell you what is the strength of these ligands are. Okay. Depending, keeping the metal constant, oxidation state constant, you are changing ligand and you are saying that the splitting you are varying. So that will indirectly measure the strength of the ligand. Okay. Now over here you are keeping ligand constant, oxidation state constant, everything constant, but you are changing the metal center. Cobalt, rhodium, iridium in the periodic table look at. Now you see how they are increasing. So the overall trend is 3D splitting will be least, then 4D, then 5D, metal oxidation state will also vary, that is also over here. All these things summarized together, I will tell you what is summarized to, this is what it summarized to. Okay. You can take a series of compound, just vary one thing, either ligand you vary or metal you vary. You keep on doing, you come to a conclusion that 5D will have higher splitting than 4D and 3D and higher oxidation state will have higher splitting. Now there is something called electrochemical series, this is what is electrochemical series. This is the strongest ligand, then this one, then that, 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 so. So the idea here is, if you have high oxidation state and strong ligand, you are definitely going to get a low spin complex. High oxidation state splitting will be high, strong ligand splitting will be high. So low spin complex means it is the splitting which is going to be high, so the electron cannot jump to the EG, so it is going to be low spin, spin will be minimized, it will stay in T2G. Now you can think about the different permutation combination, that is why it is not that very easy to say what is going to happen unless you give the exact combination. So the strong field ligand, they will tend to give you high delta G or delta 0, right? T2G EG separation will be high, therefore it will give you a low spin complex. 
strong field ligand will tend to give you a low spin complex. But that does not mean that any metal you take you will always get low spin with let us say cyano or you know these any of the alkyl or nitrite. You have to of course, you have to you also have learned that 5D will have more splitting than 4D and 3D. Higher oxidation state will have more splitting than lower oxidation state. So, it is a combination of all these three factors where the ligand is in terms of spectro electrochemical uh, spectrochemical series not spectro spectrochemical series where the ligand is whether it is strong field this is the strong field these are the weak field where it is and then what is the oxidation state of the metal and what orbital metal is having. Okay? If everything strong 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 then you are going to get high splitting low spin. If it is very small you are invariably going to get high spin. Okay? You just read through little bit first the slide look at the slide and then go through the books I, I hope it will be clear. Okay? Now, it is summarized in here once again and this is the summarize for this ligand. So, overall after having this you should be able to calculate the crystal field stabilization energy. How much with respect to the 0, how much stabilize or destabilize it is. So, over here each of the electron over here I said it is 4 d q right 4 d q and this is 6 d q. So, you can see that 3 of them let us say if you have 3 of them 4 this is 4 d q 4 times 3 will be 12 and 2 times 6 will be this is 6 d q this is also 12. So, 3 over here 2 over here net stabilization net destabilization will be 0 nothing is left. 3 over here, 2 over here, symmetrically filled, 4 times 3, 2 times 6. Now, the moment you put it here, one electron, the stabilization energy, crystal field stabilization energy, that is what called crystal field stabilization energy, 3 and 2 is 0. In this case, it will be 4 d q. Of course, d q ha has a value different for different compound as we have seen in the d q is changing, but we we do not you know memorize those data just say that it is 4 d q. 4 d q could be 500 wave number, 4 d q could be 2000 wave number, but this is 4 d q that d q depends on what is the extent of splitting, how much how far it is splitted. Okay. Now, this is having 4 d q stabilization this configuration. 3 and 2 cancels out just 4 d q left. If you have one more electron over here 3 2 cancel out 8 d q right one more 12 d q 3. So, you can calculate also 4 times 6 is going to be 24 and 2 times 6 this is stabilization this is destabilization 12. So, it is also 12 d q right. For other way to say it 2 and 3 is cancelling completely 0 1 2 3 4 times 3 12. So, this is 4 d q this is 6 d q over here it is each of them are 4 nothing is over there 4 times 6 minus 24 d q stability stabilization means usually we put minus. Okay that much it is stabilized. So, you can that these are number that is called crystal field stabilization energy. So, you can of course, this you know calculate based on this it is 4 or 0.4 I mean if you are saying delta 0 then it is 0.4 and 0.6 if it is if we are calling 10 d q this is 6 d q and 4 d q. Right. It is very simple math you should be able to do. For example, over here case 1 you have low spin case that means the splitting is high, low spin case. So, the stabilization is going to be 5 times 4, 5 electrons 4 d q each 
or 0.4 delta 0 h. So, it is going to be 20 d q over here it is going to be 0 right. So, this is again it is called crystal field stabilization energy due to this crystal field theory the splitting comes and thereby what is the stabilization energy. You look back to the valence bond theory you do not talk about any stabilization you cannot talk all d orbitals are degenerate means same energy d x y d x z d x whatever are the same energy here you have splitted them therefore, stability and unstability are coming into the picture that is what is crystal field theory for octahedral.